Today, I'm looking forward to my conversation with John Newbert, owner of Newbert Painting in Brook Park, Ohio, outside of Cleveland. John has built a multi-million dollar business before there was YouTube, social media, or influencers, if you can believe it. He did it with sound business principles, and I know we can all learn a bunch from John. I'm really looking forward to our conversation, so let's get to it. My name is Scott Lawler, and I'm a 35-year veteran of the painting industry where I've been part of growing several multi-million dollar painting companies. I have worn all the hats and have experienced everything you have experienced, are experiencing, or will experience. There is lots of chatter about getting to a million dollars, but what very few focus on is what it takes to blast through Death Valley and create the multi-million dollar company of your dreams. We don't focus on fads, tricks, or shortcuts. We focus on solid foundational business principles and data that deliver results. This is the Consulting for Contractors Beyond a Million Dollar Podcast. Welcome, John, to the podcast. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. So, John, take me back to the beginning. Tell us a little bit about, you know, how you started, um, you know, back, what, some 48 48 years years, ago. 48 years ago. Take us back to the beginning. Yeah, I I graduated from high school in 1975, and uh, my first summer I painted six houses and eight, eight houses the second summer. My brother had painted for some guy, and... I said, one day I just quit my job in the supermarket and said, let's start a painting business. And, and I was, uh, um, I just kept getting bigger and bigger. I was in uh, business school uh, at Cleveland State and uh, eventually got my MBA also. And my mentor was uh, head of the uh, of Department of Labor during part of his years at uh, Cleveland State. And he taught, taught uh, entrepreneurship and strategic planning. So... So I had a pretty good basis to start with, but we I just generally got bigger every year. Um, had to learn the, the business school didn't teach you the people part of trying to manage business and manage customers and employees. But uh, we, uh, I through trial and error, I learned how to manage people and hire managers that would run the business. And we figured out the sales part too. We, we did a lot of sales training uh, probably about 20, 25 years ago that, that really helped us out, and we've, uh, um, but uh, we still got a really good business. Uh, we today we do about uh, about three to four million. I think we just barely hit four million. I don't know if it was last year, or the year before. I think it was the year before we hit. We hit about four million, and uh, but we've had we've had a pretty good run. So you kind of glossed over this. So you went to college though, and you basically painted your way through college. Is that the way you'd say that? Yeah, I, I paint. I actually painted for. Uh, nine summers and I even did some interior work and uh, and then I worked then I eventually started hiring managers I started hiring uh, uh, op- uh, operations managers and, uh, and and people that, that would both manage and sell and and, uh, and basically I worked myself into more of a managerial position and uh, I've always been a salesperson so to even today, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll sell about over a million dollars with the paintwork a year myself, and so I, I never. That's a lot, a lot. I know a lot of uh, people that build these businesses. Uh, they get get rid of the sales role, but I've 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 always kept the sales role. So I'm even in, right now the busiest time of the year. I'll 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 be in the office about a couple of days a week and maybe part of Saturday. And I'll be out selling uh, four days a week. So I, so I, I have some good people. That's hard to do, but I have good people around me. Yeah. So you w- got your undergraduate, and then went on to get your MBA. So I would have to think you're really not thinking that you're going to be a painting on paint contractor. You're actually thinking you're getting your MBA and you're going to do something else. Is that fa- fair to say? Um, no, by the time I was working on my, uh, by, by the time I graduated my undergrad, I pretty much knew I was going to paint. Well, I, I, let's see, I have to think about that. Yeah. After, after I finished my undergrad, I was still dealing with whether I wanted to be a painter or do something else. I, I did, I became a college agent at Northwestern Mutual and tried to sell life insurance and I was too young and I had been horrible at it. And finally, when I got married, probably I was about 24, uh, Made, pretty much made the decision that uh, I was going to uh, just run the painting business, but I, I don't even think I'd started my MBA work yet. So, so by the time I, I was in the MBA program, I was using my work in the MBA program to to learn how to 
how to run the, uh, a painting business. Great. So you're a painter initially, so you're actually applying the paint. How quickly did you stop applying paint and start being more of a business owner, sales manager, whatever? Well, like I said, after my ninth, I, 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 by my ninth year, I completely weaned myself from, uh, from actually painting. So I did, I never painted again. So it was just, uh, you know, I, uh, I just had, I, you wear a lot of hats when you run a painting business. So you're, you're everything, your, your sales, HR, marketing, you, you name it. But I took a completely different role and had to learn how to, how to, ma- how to manage a, ma- manage a small company. Okay. And so who, who was your first hire that wasn't a painter? What, what, what did you do first? Um, hmm. Well, my first hire would be uh, probably my office manager. Uh, she was she got hired in my twelfth year in business. She's still with me. She st- she was eighteen, and she's uh, she. Uh, so I hired her and and, and another uh, young lady. Uh, they were both off- hired as office managers, and they're best friends. They still they're still friends today. But one one works here. And ironically, the other one sells us our, our health insurance. So she, so I'm still so connected with her. But that was my first one. All our, all our uh, operations managers have come up through the system 100%. And we, we have never hired any managers uh, from outside. So your first hire was, an, was your office manager, and she's still with you today? Yep. Wow. Okay, so you're running the business sales, you're doing hiring, you're scheduling. So there's, there's two of you for a while. How long did you run with just the two of you? And then what? Did, where did you go from there? Um, it's hard to say. We we, uh, we we by when I hired her, I had about thirty employees in the summer and a couple, maybe a couple off season. We really didn't have a big, we didn't have an inside operation set up yet. So we were just mainly strictly seasonal business. Um, I'd say when I when 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 she was hired on, I probably had a couple managers, the guys that ran crews for us that we hired as summer managers, and eventually they started getting like a full became full time people, and uh, so I started experimenting with hiring other uh, other people uh, managing crews. Okay, and you just said something that jogged my memory. Back then, you were primarily a summer um, contractor that hired temporary college students to do most of the work. Is that correct? Correct. And our summer operation is still largely the same model model today. So you hire um, people to manage and do the work and you hope to get a couple years out of them, hopefully before they graduate and move on. You, 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 we hire uh, high school seniors that fit our hiring algorithm, which is a uh, high point average, um, been active in school and they've had, they've had a good work history. So that, that's, that's the people we want. And, uh, that, that, that hasn't, that hasn't changed. So, and, and then our managers though, are people that have successfully performed in our business and then we'll hire mine in a full-time position to, to, to run the company. Okay. So at what point did you start adding some non-seasonal work or year round work or whatever you call it in your business? When did you start doing more of the, you know, bread and butter, normal, whatever you want to call it versus just your seasonal work? We probably started doing some of that about 30 years ago, but we really weren't, we really weren't that good. And we didn't really know what we were doing. And I'd say in the last 20 years, we've got, we've, we're way more serious about it. And we, our model for interior work is to hire experienced painters. And we don't, we don't, we have, we do have painters we've trained from scratch, but it's uh, far more efficient to hire a professional painter that's already been trained by somebody else. Uh, and that, and that's, so that's, that's how we hired. So we've learned so much through the years by some of the people we've brought on and we have very low turnover in our full-time uh, jobs. I mean, my head cabinet guy has been with me about 25 years and I have, I have, a few, I have probably, we have 10 inside painters. I'd say half of them have been with us over 10 years. Wow. Okay. So you start developing a, uh, a segment of your workforce that is uh, year round. And then you have the second component, which is seasonal work. And that is essentially exterior work. That's, that's correct. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty simple business model. It's pretty tight. It's a pretty tight model and we don't vary too much about it. A lot of our competitors that, 
you know, when we've had people leave our company and started their own companies, they, they all veer into commercial work and they, they can hit higher sales in commercial work. I'm not sure they make any more money doing it. I think the, there's a, I think there's a lot of landmines in doing commercial work, sometimes lower margins, possibly payment issues and maybe, um, uh, how quick you get paid in, in the residential market. Like last year we did, you know, somewhere three to 4 million in sales and we knock on wood. We, we, uh, we didn't have, we finished the year clean without any payment problems. That's a rare, that's a rare year. There's, there's usually all, always something that you, you're chasing somebody down. Sure. But, uh, in the commercial world, I don't know. I don't think it's the same as, I don't think it's like that. And we get paid pretty quick. Yeah. So in the earlier years, um, and even me, maybe now, but take me, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking about how you built this. Um, how did you manage your cash flow when you were doing the bulk of the work, say in a seven and eight, eight seven or eight month um, time frame, but needing to have money 12 months, you know, how did you, uh, you know, how did you even come up with this concept and how did you manage your, you know, your, your, your payables? Um, and, and, and of course paying yourself for 12 months when you really are working closer to seven. Well, we never ha- we've never borrowed money. We're we're we we're, we're all our cash is internally dr- driven. So we when you have a painting business, you you have to save enough. At the, at, at, you know, in your seasonal business, you just have to save enough money to to make it through the winter and and have enough money to get your marketing going and everything else going in the following year. So we always had enough money, and by the time we're in March or April, we we're low in cash. The business was always low in cash, and and that's 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 what you have to do in this business. And if you don't do that and you spend it all, you're in trouble. You don't have the you don't have the funds to uh, to get the business started. Uh, you know the next the next year. Great. So, tell me a little bit about how you built your customer base. How did you get the work in the early days, pre internet? We're talking at this point. Um, well, we we built up. We we have our own mailing list which we still use. We we build internally. We we, we build our own mailing list of. We decided where we wanted the market, and so we, we 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 in those markets we know where, uh, where where the houses are that we want to market. Whether they're brick houses or frame houses or aluminum siding, and we we did big big mail marketing campaigns, and we still do big mail marketing campaigns even though they're not not as effective as they were. Uh, uh, back, back, uh, you know, th- 34 years ago, there's still plenty effective and we do all the other stuff we do. We do stuff on Facebook and we are, we don't do any AdWords. We organically show up, uh, high on, uh, on Google and mo- uh, most of our searches. I mean, we're under all the paid stuff, but we're still, we still get plenty of calls. Uh, uh, th- uh I, I mean, every day I get probably half dozen calls at half dozen a dozen calls that are straight from the internet that aren't even related to any of our direct mail marketing. So even today, what is your direct marketing campaign look like? How do you do it? And how often do you do it? And maybe even what you spend on it? Irv, uh, this year we're, I don't even know what our budget is exactly. We're, we're, we're probably sending out about 150,000 pieces. We we're, we're, we have a scaled back campaign because we had a huge backlog and exterior work that, so we we don't have the we don't need, have the need to put as much marketing dollars out out, but we'll, when we when we bring our marketing campaign back online full strength, we'll we'll mail out about three hundred thousand pieces. And I think next year we'll be bringing it online because uh, the 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 uh, the the demand for painting work has been on. A, I mean, the amount of, the call rate we're getting has probably been on a decline for probably for the last eighteen months, but. It, it it hasn't hurt us that much because of backlogs, but if, if next year is going to be really even this year will be pretty lean for some painters because our target customers, these upper income people, are traveling all over the world this year, and uh, paint jobs aren't high priority. Yeah. So when you say next year, you think you'll bring it? I think your words were in in house. Does that mean? No, we'll bring, we'll bring it up. We'll bring it up to uh, up to where we normally do it. Which oh, is okay. About three hundred thousand pieces. All right. Yeah. And are you doing that through a mailing house? How are you actually fulfilling that? Because this is something actually relatively new to a lot of the younger painters. Um, but they've only known promotion of their business through the internet, right? Through either organic through their website or buying AdWords. That, you know, a, mailing a postcard or a, or something like that is it's foreign. So tell us tell us a little bit about how well, you actually do that. 
Well, we're a little, we're a little bit different. We we have actually have our own mailing mailing list. So we so we skip whole streets and neighborhoods. So we we actually built. We're still working off list that we built 20, 30 years ago, and we've added lists and stuff like that since then. But we, ours is highly tailored to the where 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 we want to market, and we take homes everywhere. I mean, so we get we get we get homes all over all over our, our metro area. But we we have certain cities we 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 market really hard, and we direct it in. There's other ways of doing it. Uh, some some people will use a, a postal program where they can pick their own. Uh, care routes and zip codes and things like that. And that that's efficient for some people, but we want our piece to come in on its own, and we don't want it mixed in with a bunch of other mailing stuff. So we we're willing to pay uh, to have it, have our our self mailers, which we use, um, um, uh, go out to our uh, go out to potential customers. Okay, and so that's that's pretty much what we do. So, anyways, that I, I forget what I was gonna say. You're pretty okay, and pretty simple, pretty simple uh, message, or is it a is it a stock thing that's the same thing every time? To how much energy do you put into the? Oh, it has to be different, or design, or the offer, or the call to action. Tell us a little bit about your philosophy there and what's we, worked for you. I, I'm I'm a believer in direct copy, and so what we write is a sales letter, in inside there. But obviously, there's a lot of graphics involved. You know, today today you send out stuff, and it's uh, there's yeah, obviously you're gonna have a graphic designer design it but it's still it's still a letter i don't like the idea of just sending postcards out with just pictures and stuff pictures are really effective but you really to really get your message and your story and your story is so important you really you really direct having a long piece which is a letter is the best way to tell your story and how did you come up with this is this dan kennedy is this pre-dan you know is this this you know give us a little feedback as how you came up with these ideas and who's your guru who do you who did um you- my direct mail no guru i just did all the stuff my own so it's you I, yeah i wrote i learned how to write long copy uh i, I mean I, I wrote i got advertising books uh there's an old guy there's a guy that's deceased now named dave david ogilvy who was a. Uh, uh, one of the gurus of, of, of marketing and direct mail marketing and a whole bunch of stuff that's still relevant today. And uh, he owned a big ad agency and I'd, so I'd study some of that, but most of it is just stuff that, that we wrote ourselves. Okay. Let's talk about um, your summer workforce. Um, I don't, it doesn't matter the time frame, but you know, those three, four, five months you scale up and how many people painters now I'm talking about, Will you add for those peak, uh, those peak months? This year, this year we'll go from around uh, around maybe fifteen twenty employees up to about seventy five, and and that's that's not I mean and that sounds like a lot, but we my when I was younger my peak year was uh, one hundred and thirty people in the summer, so which was crazy out of your mind. Uh, I don't know if I could find that many people today. And, 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 and paint and paint costs are way more, way higher than they were back then. Sure. So how do you onboard and train and manage an additional, whatever, 40, 50 people? What, how, what that must be extraordinarily organized and not for the faint of heart. Um, it's, it's not that easy. It's, it's, uh, you, you just, you, you bring people on you have, It's a lot of planning involved in bringing people on. And you you have training meetings. You you do your uh, your onboarding meetings. Uh, you do safety meetings. Safety meetings are key here. We do safety meetings at the beginning of the year and every two weeks at payroll. I think it's every week. I think we do a safety meeting. It's a paid meeting for safety. So safety is our number one value. And 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 a lot of that is uh, uh, you know we like we, like we're, we're we're a painting contract. You saw our crews uh, out painting. You're probably the, one of the only painting companies going to see all harnessed up on the roof and all that. We don't we don't go up on roofs without harnesses, so safety safety is huge. We uh, we just did a workshop the this this uh, yeah this last weekend. We had about twenty guys in here, twenty two guys in here, and we did orientation uh, Friday for a couple about two hours, and we had them back the next morning. We we're showing a bunch a bunch of skill stuff to uh, uh, our painters, and, and it's really more just exposing them to it because. You really have to do it on the job, and then on the job we we have a certification program, and so you have to certify in these twelve different skills that we think are really important, from painting a door to handling a ladder, 
And so from their base pay, they, they, uh, they get every time they pass the skill, their pay goes up 25 cents. So potentially by the end of the year, they could have another three dollars in base pay ad- added on for uh, get it going through our certification program. Okay. And you also are really counting on return uh, painters uh, mm-hmm. from the high school year all the way. Hopefully you'll get four summers out of them. Is that what you're thinking? Today, you don't get that many years out of them because today we're competing with internships and large corporations. So the guys, the people we want are the same ones the big companies have. So you're, 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 you're most cases, you're having people that work here one summer and they'll run a crew for one or two and that's it. I mean, once in a while you get a few people that, that work longer or don't, or, or, or stay longer, or maybe work a longer season because they, they don't go back to school or something. Yeah. So that's one of the, re- the one of the ways you really um, on board an extra 50 people is because it's really not 50. It's maybe another 20 or 25 and 25 have been there before heard, heard the, the speech run the process and they already know your systems and they're now more in management of the, uh, yeah, but they, they, there's still a lot that they don't know. So you're, you're, you're always training, you're always training and even your crew leaders, uh, don't know everything, and so the operations managers—they're out there, they're out in the field. I, I was out in the field today, uh, uh, you know, with the, with the crew. I had an estimate on, on a street, and I, one of our crews was working, just happened to be working nearby, and so I went to see him, and and they were uh, uh, I was talking to the crew, and they were caulking some stuff that I wouldn't caulk. It was some vertical siding. They were trying to fill all the cracks on vertical on vertical siding. And, and I pretty much had to take them around the house and show them that vertical siding. I wasn't too interested in caulking, but I, I showed them that the caulking had to be done where the wood met the brick surfaces and the windows and the corners and stuff on the, on this wood frame house. Okay. So tell me a little bit about your organizational chart. And so what, what's your, um, what's your management team or, you know, whatever you call them, what are the, what do you call them and who are they in your company? Uh, we we have two operations managers. We we're we uh, and three and we have, and they have a support staff of one two. They have five office people supporting them during the summer. And and we're running this year. We're running a, a little lean. We're running uh, 12, 13 crews. So uh, we we you know, so that that that's that's not a, for us. That's not a real real big setup. But that's what we're doing for this year. But we'll still have we'll still have between that and our inside work and everything will be about seventy to seventy five employees. Now, do you have a right-hand person or someone that acts like you or has the same type of authority? Uh, yeah, my operations manager, Matt, has been with me since 1987. He started when he were here when he was 18. So uh, he painted initially, and then he got moved up. Uh, within a few years, he moved up into uh, uh, helping running crews, and eventually, years later, he became a head operations manager. So with your year-round crews, is this a different, a different marketing message? Do you do anything different for them, or this is just interior work, cabinet work, et cetera, et cetera, that just comes in organically as well? Um, interior work is a different business, and so we we so we have two businesses on the inside. We do kitchen cabinets, and so we have four people working on kitchen cabinets, and we do three kitchens every week, and so that that's and we have a fifty thousand dollars spray booth, legal spray booth. <laughs> which is important because uh, if you, if you get, you'll get busted by your the fire department in your city if you don't put a legal spray spray booth in. And we we heard rumor that one of our competitors got busted and shut down on that recently. I don't I I haven't confirmed it, but I heard that as a rumor. And uh, we uh, and we have six six painters that do interior work. We uh, we we do all almost all of our I'd say about eighty percent of our interior work comes from uh, repeat customers. And we, once someone's on board with, with us, we, we market to them forever. So we would, we, uh, when, once someone's hired us, they, they're going to get a letter from us once a month and they're going to get an email from us once or twice a month reminding that we do inside work. And the good news is you're not in competition with anybody on any of that work. You just get, you know. so the, uh, yeah, the spray booth is an important one to, uh, make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's. So it sounds like you do a lot of cabinet work and that's especially for you guys if you're running 40% of your year round people in that. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it, it's a, it's a great business. I don't know how long it'll last, but 
people have a lot of a lot of cabinets that uh, are uh, they're old cabinets and they don't have a budget to put a new kitchen in. So they may be doing they might be doing countertops, maybe four, sometimes appliances. And they'll they'll instead of getting brand new cabinets, they'll they'll just uh, uh, spray the cabinets. And sure. it, it's uh, it, it it it's it's the, the, you know someone has someone has a real expensive home and a multi million dollar house. They're not they're not going to spray cabinets. But in the more moderate market, especially a lot of older people, uh, you know, from maybe in their fifties on up to you know seniors, you know, people up. I've had customers eighty years old. Mm-hmm having us spray their cabinets that that's a really it's a real nice market yeah you said something very interesting i want to just dig in there you said i'm not sure how long it's going to last and this is something that we've talked about a bit um how long do do you think it will last or what you know how how do you think about the cabinet spraying and the the refinishing business there well i mean i think the i think that market could go 10 15 years easy whether whether it stays as strong as it is now it it may not. I mean, the, these 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 trends change. I mean, so the trend went towards white cabinets, and now it's going back to a, a, a different type of natural wood cabinet that looks more, you know, that with more what people want today. But people who don't have that kind of budget to do that, I mean, they're going to take some old oak cabinets that really are past their useful life, is and and they'll paint them and get maybe ten more years out of them. And I think that's going to continue. And there's and there's a there's prob there's a lot of cabinets that haven't been touched. So yeah. I mean, so I think I but it, it you know it's hard to predict, but it it's it's not going to go on forever. Okay, but you think you got another ten years without question? Uh, who knows for sure? But it still seems decently strong. Well, we are about halfway through this episode of the Beyond a Million Dollar podcast from Consulting for Contractors, and we still have some great content left for you. Before we get to that, though, I wanted to let you know about some resources that are available to you via the show notes. You'll find links to our website, social media outlets, and highlights of this show. You'll even be able to schedule a discovery call with Scott and our team to find out how consulting for contractors can help your contracting business. It's very low pressure. We'll ask you just a couple questions, see what your current situation is, and then get you started toward the contracting business of your dreams. The best part about it, it's completely free. So just click on the link in the show notes, or you can visit our website at www.consulting, the number four, contractors.com and reach out to us there. Again, that website is www.consulting, the number four, contractors.com. Now here's the remainder of the show. Okay. So you've been doing this a long time. Is there a exit strategy for you or how do you think about the future for you personally in regards to your business? Uh, I have a daughter in the business. Uh, she doesn't, she, I don't think she'll be running the business. It'll be, she, she, she's, she'll probably be running this business with my, uh, my operations managers and my, and my, and my wife, something happens to me, they'll just keep running it. So, uh, they may need to bring in a finance type person that, that the balance things out. I'm a, I'm a, my natural skill set is I'm an, I'm a spreadsheet guy. If I was in a big company, I'd be a chief financial officer, I'm, I'm, I'm a numbers guy. I, I, I'm really good at building bonus programs and doing all sorts of crazy stuff on, 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 uh, on, 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 on spreadsheets. And, uh, my operations manager is more, we're both introverted, but he's more outgoing than I am. He's more of a people person. If we were going to hire a new operations manager at some point next year, we think we need, we need to hire an additional manager. He'll be the one that will identify that person. Be, he'll, he'll identify that person before me. Okay. So how much time do you take off now? Or do you just love work and you work all the time? Oh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I love work. I work Monday through Saturday, but I, but I've always been out of town about a month of the, about f- at least 30, day, 30 days a year, except for the pandemic. And so I, so I like to travel. So I'll, I'll probably go to Ireland for a couple of weeks uh, sometime before the end of the year, early next year. I did that right. That was my last trip, big trip before the pandemic was Ireland. My wife heads off to uh, Italy for a couple of weeks a year. I'd probably have to do one of those. I don't know if I'll do that this year, but we do a lot of domestic trips. I go up to Mackinac Island and New York. So I go up, I'll do that in September. I'll go up there for about five days 
And uh, uh, so I, so I, I, I think that getting out of the office is, is crazy important. And then when I'm at home, I'm, a, I'm, I'm like a master gardener. I mean, one of my friends owns a big commercial landscaping company and he says, uh, he's glad he, he's glad I didn't go in the landscaping business. Cause that's my real passion. I love, I love landscaping and I, I, I have, I have all sorts of crazy plants on my property. I spend a lot of time taking care of it. So I like landscaping a lot, probably a lot more than I like painting. <laughs> well, if you had it to do over again, I guess, but it's a little late now. Yep. Um, so this is years ago when I saw you and heard you present at a PCA AST function. Um, t- talk to us a little bit about the way you look at finances and compensation and um, you know, how do you, how do you compensate your management or your in, you know, your, your man, you know, I guess I just call them management. So your, your key people talk to me a little bit about how you view money, profit, all that. You were listening when you, when you were there. Okay. Yes, so I we, was. So we, uh, uh, we, we pay really well. We pay really well through the whole system. So even our starting painters this year will be making around 21, $22 an hour. So we, 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 and, and we, we got a little underpriced during the pandemic and that hurt us. And this year we brought it up above, above market average. And we're, we're, we're swamped with painters. We're overhired right now. So we're, we're trying to figure out what to do with more, more people than we, than we need. So, but uh, anyways, we're, we're a believer that you, you can't be cheap with, with people. Um, you, you, you have to charge enough. You don't, you, you being the cheap guy is, is a really bad strategy. Um, I believe in sharing the, 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 uh, the money with with my managers, we uh, we all operate out of the same bonus pool, and obviously I get the biggest share of it. I'm the I'm the equity owner. I don't I don't share any equity. My business mentor is very adamant that you that businesses make their biggest mistakes when they start doing equity partnerships because they always they always end up those the divorces are almost always ugly. So I, I've always so my my mentor though said you just pay well, and so. Uh, my operations manager, he, 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 he just finished, uh, two years ago, made a couple hundred thousand dollars and my other operations manager, I mean, he's makes over a hundred thousand. My office manager makes over a hundred thousand dollars. And obviously I make more than that. So there, there's, there's, I pay, I and, and but we work out of the same pool. It's partly based off sales, but also, uh, they, they, they get, they get their percentage of, of the pot. And so in good years, in good years, I probably make, uh, I, I don't, some company owners in good years just make run away and take a lot of extra money and don't give it to their people. And I do. And in bad years, my bad years aren't as bad as other people because we all share in the down years too. And those are tough. So, mm-hmm. so we, I try, I try to have almost equity without having equity and, and it works. It doesn't work for every managers. I'm, I still, have, I've still had guys leave here that were making, you know, hundred thirty, hundred forty thousand dollars 140000 dollars and they thought they were being underpaid and, and went off and did something else and all that. But, uh, but we, 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 I'm a big, big believer in sharing, uh, the, 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 the uh, sharing the money. Yeah. Excellent. Um, tell me a little bit about your meeting rhythm. Now it's been interesting to hear a little bit that you're an introvert and, and, and I think for those that are listening, um, um, this is always fascinating, and I don't talk a lot before we record these because I really want it just to be live and fresh. But if you've caught John a couple of different times saying um, he's not sure about this or he's not sure about that, and that's because he's hired good people and delegated to them. So is he aware of what's going on in this business? Yes, he surely is. But every every detail, some of it's handled by other people. But um, on a macro level, tell me a little bit about the meeting rhythm of your company, like what, how do you keep it all in order? Who do you meet with? How often, when do you meet? And you know, what, how do you keep it all straight within your company? Um, well, I mean, we meet informally all every day. So we're, we're being a small company, you work out of the same office. You get, you, you cer- certainly have our informal thing. Um, but the, we, we work off of like a master to do list every year and that, that, and that gets divided up by everyone has certain things that they do. So we have a rhythm of what we do off season. So when, when we're, when we're doing marketing and stuff like that, 
that's all all that stuff was done back in November and December. It was all put in the bag in maybe January. So we're but when so when we go into our season, all the hard work's already been done. And I got a feeling that a lot of people do it at the last minute mm-hmm. and that, that you're you're at a disadvantage. But we we meet uh we, we, we meet like once once a week. Um I think our our uh, um our our I th- the the way we do it is very similar to uh uh the book that uh that a lot of people follow which is the traction, traction. model mm-hmm. track tractions like tractions a phenomenal book uh i don't think we follow that to the letter uh, we we definitely we definitely don't follow it to the letter but we 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 do we do we do do use a lot of that stuff you have to keep people accountable to to what what they're promising and all that so we meet for about about an hour uh, once a week, but we we have plenty of meetings in between and all that. So yeah, and do you have uh, you talking about November December as you're rolling out? Do you do some kind of a company retreat, offsite meeting? Who, who's involved with that? How does how do, how do you determine what? So for instance, using 2024, when will you start that process? Who will you start it with? And then how do you roll it out? Um, well, some of the process is just the same every year. So we, we, it's just, we just know by certain dates we have to have it done and it's all on a big master list, which we work off of. Um, we do have offsite. We, we don't have offsite. We have, we, 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 we have meetings on site for uh, two day meetings. Uh, we did not do one this year. This year we, we, we knew finishing last year that we, uh, that we had, we had done poorly in recruiting for a couple of years. We, I mean, just last year we couldn't get people into our office to come in, show up for an inter- interview. We were hiring people off to, over the phone, and so we knew that we we knew that we had to go into the season with uh, with focus uh, with mainly a focus on recruitment, and we put a recruitment schedule uh, program together that uh, basically just give us a, a gave us a flood of really high quality ac- applicants, and we're over hired. And, and I think we're helped out by the economy. I think big companies are cutting back in their internships right now. There's a lot of hiring freezes. So I think that helped us and all that. So yeah. but we, we just went focus on one thing and next year we'll, we, we will have off. We'll, we'll have a, we'll, we'll be back to a two day meeting, which is a little bit more motivational. You spoke earlier a little bit about an algorithm. You called it about um, starting in high school. And, and um, so tell me a little bit about who you're looking for and how do you get the candidates to answer the questions honestly so that you get a candidate that you like? Well, what, what, what I've, what I've learned is there's a lot of hiring books out there and how to, how, how to hire people. You get behavioral interviews. So we've, we've trained ourselves in behavioral interviews, but really um, our, our algorithm matters way more. I could have a guy that blows it in a behavioral interview and could be a great hire and I could have another. These can't. These people, young people, have already figured out how to get beyond the behavioral interview. They, they, they under they understand how it works, and so you you could have someone that knows how to interview really really well, and they could be a ter- terrible candidate. So we we're looking mainly at past performance. We you know, we're, we're hiring a high school senior. We want high point average. Uh, that we're looking for their involvement in the extracurriculars during school, and 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 a good job history. And when, when they show up with, with low point average and not too much involvement in high school and maybe uh, mediocre job history, they come in here complaining about their past job. If they do get hired, they usually wash out pretty quick. So so we rely uh, pretty much all, all off the algorithm more than anything else. So do you have financial targets, revenue targets I'm talking about now? Um, how, how do you determine what your goals are? Um, I'm not a big goal person. Some people are. I mean, some people have all these stretch goals. Uh, I we 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 don't even set budgets now. I, I have a budget spreadsheet, but it's updated about once a month, and and it's, it's it always changes. And yeah, you, you have to spend the amount of money you got to spend. You got to buy a truck. You got to buy a truck. I mean, I, I sort of set a target for the year, but if we have, if we have to go over budget, that's fine. We'll just spend the money. I, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but goals for the year, like like this year, we're limited by how many crew leaders we have. So we have around 12, 13 people that we can put out and run crews. We'd like to have more, but that's all we have trained. So we'll we'll keep. We're, so actually, we're actually going to run. We're not going to we're not going to try to to beat that. We're not we're not going to try to do uh, uh, the impossible and then start messing up jobs and and uh, have, having bigger problems. So we 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 know our limits. So. Uh, 
we're we're a lifestyle business and we're we're pretty comfortable at at at, at, at pretty much the size we are and we're, we're, I have, I don't have any ambitions at this point that this company will go to like five or ten million or anything like that. And my, my operations manager might want to grow it if, if 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 I was out of the picture. But but that that's uh, where we're where we're comfortable with where we're at. So you talked a little bit before about your uh, spreadsheet person. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you're looking at in your data. What do you what are your KPIs that you've created for yourself that you're paying attention to? Um, you know, what are the, some of those things that you might share? Okay. So one of the things that painters, one of the things when you talk to painters, they always tell you what they're charged per hour is, oh, we're charging, we're getting $60 now, we're getting 70 80 whatever, whatever they're getting per hour. I don't believe any of that. So you have to, you have to track actual hours. So in your, in your whole system, in your job costing, you're, you're tracking actual, actual revenue in actual hours. And actual revenue means you, you and, and 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 I don't really look at, at necessarily individual jobs. I'm looking at the whole picture, but I mean, if you damage something and it costs you a couple thousand dollars, that comes out of the revenue. If uh, you know, if, if you have a painter working in your warehouse, doing just helping stuff and it's not chargeable to a job, that that has to go somewhere. So so ultimately, ultimately, you have to have a system where, when when you're uh, my, my guess is a lot of people that think they're charging sixty seventy dollars an hour and might be bringing in as little as forty five or fifty and and so you really you really have to have a system that catches as much what I call leakage as possible and there's always going to be leakage there's no per, there's no perfect system but you really you really want to minimize uh, your leakage so but spreadsheets we do our bonus system for our crew leaders on um, our crew leaders are paid off of productivity and and survey quality ratings. So that's on our spreadsheet. We keep track of uh, the hourly stuff for, for all the jobs. And uh, th- those are the two main things, but uh, that, that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. So when you talk about the crew leaders being bonused off of productivity, is that based on dollars, on hours? How, how, do, you, what do, you, how do you consider someone productive? So yeah, so they get, they, they're getting part of their money off of their dollar per hour. And it's on, so they have a scale that they can uh, reach. And, uh, again, that gets affected by if, if they're running clean jobs and, and they don't have, they're not, they don't have a lot of charges on against their job. They can do really, really well. So some crew leaders crush it, make a lot of money and other crew leaders struggle with it. Uh, then we also, again, have survey ratings and I'd say half our ratings are, are, are survey based off customers. So they, it's, uh, so they, on a scale of one to 10, and uh, the other half is managerial ma- managers uh, will rate people on things like uh, uh, are they getting paperwork in on, on time and, and things like that. So that, that's how you uh, that's one of the ways you can get people to, to uh, uh, follow, follow your uh, your program. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what we call culture. Um, tell me what's it like to work at Newbert Painting? What what would I expect? You know, what's the vibe there? What are the activities? What do you guys do that is interesting, unique, or would keep me there or keep me coming back? You, know, you, you try to keep a good culture that people like. Our, our best cultures are inside people. They, they Most of them really love working here. So we really, we're really we really lucky there. Our management team has a pretty good culture. We get along really well. Summer culture, summer part of the company is a completely different part of it. And right this year, we're getting back into what we – way we were pre-pandemic uh we'll be i mean we'll have pizza every every payroll we'll be cooking steaks cooking burgers and things like that and that's pretty much every payroll which is every two weeks and so we 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 have we 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 basically have a good culture the other thing is we've done is through the years we've uh our culture has gone from uh when i started the business we probably worked we worked tons and tons of overtime and today we run these crews with hardly any overtime. People don't want the overtime. And so you run a real flexible system. You hire more painters and you have people to fill in. And uh, you just don't, you, you, they, you, you know, most of the people, if they hit 40, 45 hours, that's, they're probably one of the hardest working crews in the company that week. So that's, that's a culture change too. We don't fight people on, uh, on days off. They want days off. That's fine. They, they get them. 
Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. That's one of the things that I'm an old dog like you. I'm not quite as old as you, but you know, we used to work a lot of hours back in you know in the day, and people wanted more more money and more more opportunities. And and today, I think some of the um, desires have shifted. And I think it's uh, if you get nothing out of our discussion, it, what John just said, I think is gold. Which is, hey, we we're flexible with what's important to them. We're not going to fight them on days off or, you know, they don't want to work 50 or even 41. So be it, you know, we're going to take, um, where they're at and use them. I, I think that's really wise. Um, I know that you also in these meetings with food seem to celebrate people. Talk a little bit about that, a uh, crew leader of the week and these types of things. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So we, uh, we, we have a crew of the week at, at, uh, uh, every every week we're we're always celebrating that, and uh, we uh, our operations managers will bring food out to their they'll, they'll ask their the, the crew of the week what what they want for their their crew of the week uh, lunch, and the operations manager bring the food out to their job and they they have lunch together. Uh, my office manager has uh, uh, for our office people has. Uh, uh, birthday lunches, even though not everybody has birthdays in the summer. So we have birthday lunches during the summer. And again, the person that we're celebrating their birthday is, uh, can pick where they want the food from. And, and, and it's really not about the birthday. It's about just having food together and stuff like that. And so it's, it's, uh, so a lot of what we do is, is people oriented during the, we, uh, we we, we we very often go to an, a Cleveland Indians game. Last year, we went to a Frontier League game. We have a team in, locally, and we, we got like a whole patio thing for ourselves. We went with our uh, full-time, uh, uh, our, our, our managers, management team and our full-time painters went there. And we're doing that again in June, and we're probably going to be doing something like that with our uh, – uh, with, with uh, some of our, our, our painters during the summer too. We have some stuff planned, so – yeah. So I've never been to John's business in person, but I have followed him on social media. And what my inclination is to say that they do have a um, consistent time of gathering uh, with food at their shop. Um, they grill steaks. They're, they're, they seem very um, fun and um, engaged with their field personnel. They have them around tables. It's not like fancy you know, Ritz Carlton stuff. It's just being normal, firing up the grill and celebrating crew leaders. And I, and I, I can just tell by what I can see, um, between the lines is that they generally enjoy each other and celebrate each other. And I think there's a foundation there that maybe John won't say it himself, but I will, that I think that, um, that his workforce enjoys working with them and they enjoy being together. Is that fair to say, John? I, th I think though, I think that's uh, for the most part true and all that. There's always exceptions. Everybody has employees that are disgruntled, and you're you're not going to have, uh, uh, you're not going to keep everybody. But if you're running a good shop, there's no reason why important management people you can't keep them around for maybe five, ten, fifteen years. You should not be turning people. If, if, if you're turning people over like that every year, two or three years, uh, the problem's not with them. It's the problem is with. Uh, was probably with you or maybe how you're hiring people and things like that. Yeah. So just a couple more questions before I, we wrap up today, John, yeah. um, in your long career, what, what would you say has made you successful? Like, I guess the way to say it would be, what's your superpower? What is it that has really, um, helped you get here? That is all because of you. Um, I, I just stay on track. So every year I'm, I, 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 I we just get it. We just, uh, we just get it done. And, and I haven't traced, I haven't, uh, chased the uh, grass is greener syndrome. So I'm not always chasing, uh, you know, we, we have, we obviously have added services. We, we weren't doing cabinets at, at a, any high degree five, six years ago, but we're doing a lot of them now. So we were, we're not against taking a new service on that's important, but, we just stay on track and, and work really hard. Um, I'm always constantly learning. And so I'm a big listener of podcasts and, and reading. Uh, there's a lot of great books out there. Traction's a great book. Good to Great's a great book. Uh, the guru I followed is a guy named Peter Drucker. 
And his, mm. he has a whole library of books. He's deceased now, probably 10, 20 years, but he was uh, the guru, guru of management. And, mm. and people, all the books today are all based off of, off, off of him. So you have, to, you have to learn and you have to have good people and listen to them. Uh, they know you, you, you can't make all the decisions. So you, you have to let them do their thing and make a, make a lot of decisions. And, uh, and even if they're, even if you don't like the decisions, you have to go along with them. You can't be, if you're, if you're overriding people's decisions all the time, you're, uh, what, I mean, what, then why have them? I mean, why, why should they even do it if they're, if you're not going to let them, uh, uh, do their thing? Yeah. Excellent. And lastly, I always like to ask this question. What would you say to the emerging or growing contractor that is say in the 750 thousand eight hundred thousand you know the person that's just getting up and towards there what would you say to them uh if you had a chance to well the cha- the challenge is you're, you're when you're at that range is you're you're now trying to work yourself into a management role and you're gonna have to pay people to help start doing things for you and the people that are going to run your crews or paint for you they're going to be they're not going to be as fast as you they're not going to be as good as you and so you're taking the most profitable person out of production to grow your company. And, and that's a real challenge. So I found through the years that every time I moved, stepped up, I, we had a couple step ups, not a lot, but a couple step ups, my income de- declined every time. But I, I will, was willing to funnel that money into the people I needed to, to develop, to run, the, to run the company. And there was a pretty good payoff for, 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 do, for doing that. And that's pr- that's pretty hard to do. So, so a lot of people aren't willing to share pe- share share that money, but uh, that that's a real that, that's a real bitch. Though. When you make that when you make that uh, you're trying to go into management and you got people that are you know you 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 know you get a job done on hundred hours and they're de- they're taking one hundred thirty hours and all that you know, and that's just that's just normal. I mean that's that might be the the rate you're going to be that you'll be doing on that type of house forever. You know, but you're, you know, otherwise you could be, a, you could stay a one or two man shop and and sure you can bang the houses out a hundred hours, but you're going to wear yourself out mm-hmm. and, and you could still make a decent amount of money, but it, it, in a way it's a lot easier to, if you can work yourself out of, out of the painter role. Yeah. John, before we roll out of here, is there anything that you wished I had asked or anything else that you think you might uh, want to add before? No, I, I think we covered a lot. Uh, I'm a big cash flow person. You got to manage your cash. Uh, I, I I never felt the money in the business was was mine. I always felt it belonged to the business first. And so my I think the biggest errors I think people have is getting into the ego part of the business. Um, we uh, they they buy the big truck and 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 all the ego part. And you know I I drive I drive a I have a couple. Uh, Toyota Rav fours, and my one I go on estimate the 2014 one. My operations manager drives uh he drives he drives he right he drives a Honda Fit old Honda Fit out to all his estimates. So we we're not pretentious in any way. We make a decent amount of money, and I think that a lot of contractors, whether they're painting contractors or everyone else, they just go into the big eagle thing and spend a whole lot of money with, with their truck. Of course, they have the company name on it and all that. And uh, I I I question whether that's a good way to spend the money. Mm, well said. Well said. Well, John, this has been a pleasure. You know, um, I've known you for a bit, uh, like we said, through some of the PCA and I, yep. and I know you're a rock star and uh, have done this pre internet and, uh, very sound. And I, I appreciate your wisdom today and your insight. And, and I'm grateful that you shared it with us. Thank you very much. Thanks Scott. Appreciate it. Yeah, my Thank pleasure. You. Well, thanks again for joining us on the Beyond a Million Dollar podcast. If anything you heard on the show today intrigued you, or if you're just interested in getting in touch with Scott, please visit the show notes. You can click on the discovery call link to get started. We'd love to find out more about you, your company, and how consulting for contractors can help you grow your business to a million dollars and beyond.